Okay, good morning everybody in Hazal Kabaru. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Monday morning as we are entering into a new perasha, perashat Vayeshev. And we know the story is about Yaakov Avinu who finally settles back home in the land of Canaan. And he has the whole saga, the episode of Yosef when Yosef is taken from him and, um, and he's lost for 20 plus years and uh, the whole story how it plays out. So today, what I'd like to do is actually uh, turn to a pasuk in our perasha. And uh, take a look at what the Pasuk says right in the beginning. When Yaakov, it all begins, everything goes uh, south. When Yaakov sends Yosef to check out on his brothers. Okay, this is where the whole story begins. And if only we were there, we would just say, da, 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 Yaakov, bad idea. Don't send him, please. Of course, we weren't there and he did send him. So take a look. He says to Yosef, go check up on your brothers. They're in Shechem. So Yosef goes out. And they're very jealous already. He has dreams about them bowing to him. He has a coat, extra one up on them. So they're very jealous and upset at Yosef. And finally, Yaakov sends Yosef. And it's interesting why he sends him. Did he not know that they were jealous? Actually, the commentaries say that he knew they were jealous. And that's specifically why he sends him when they're in Shechem. Because what happened in Shechem? Anyone remember what happened in Shechem? Shechem is where Dina was abducted and the two brothers Shimon and Levi showed their love, their brotherly love for Dina. So he was hoping that the place would arouse the same feelings of love for not only Dina but also for Yosef. So he sends Yosef and hopefully they're going to make peace and shalom. And this is what Yaakov was banking on. And as he starts approaching, right here, chapter 37, Pasuk 18, they see him from far. And they say to his, they tell each other, Hine bala halomot ala zeba. Ah, look at this dreamer. Look at this dream boy coming over here. Ve'ata lechu. And now to, let us go and kill him. And let us throw him into one of the pits. And we'll blame an animal. And let's see what's going to be with his dreams. Oh yeah? We're going to bow down to you? Let's see if that's going to happen. Let's kill him. And see who's going to bow down to who. Vayishma Reuven, and Reuven, the oldest, is listening. Vayatzilehu miyadam, and he decides to save Yosef. Look at this. What an amazing, amazing, and there's a Gemara, Masechet Berachot, where Le'ah actually names him Reuven, based on this right here. One of the Gemara, it says that when she names him Reuven, she was saying prophetically, Reu, take a look, Reuven, Reu ma ben beni le ben hami. Take a look at the difference between my son and my father-in-law's son. Her son, Reuven, compared to her father-in-law, who's her father-in-law, Yitzchak, his son was Esav. She's saying, look at the difference between my son and Esav. Esav sold the birthright. He legally gave it away. And he was still jealous and trying to kill his brother for it. My son lost the birthright not willingly by mistake he moved the beds and he lost it to Yosef and look how he treats Yosef he goes out and he saves his life Reu ben Reu look at the difference between my ben my son and my father-in-law's son so Reu ben here is doing something that's very praiseworthy he goes out and he saves Yosef and he says to his brothers let us not kill him let's not spill his blood let us instead Let us throw him into this pit that's in the desert. Well, Yosef approaches. They remove the coat. Now again, the Pasuk leaves out a lot of details, but you could only imagine how Yosef here, even though it's missing, without a doubt in my mind, Yosef was begging for his life. Please don't do this. And the brothers show no mercy. Following Reuven's plan, they throw him into the pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water. Now this is obviously a very interesting pasuk. The pit is empty. What does empty mean, my friends? What is empty? Empty is empty, right? Empty is empty. Do I need to translate the word empty no if i show you an empty cup i say guys look this this cup is empty there's no water in it that's called repetitive it's okay for a person to be repetitive the torah is not usually repetitive 
And here the Torah is repeating itself. The Torah says it's empty and there's no water. Let me ask you all a math question, okay? If you know math, please answer me, okay? How much volume, if there's a hole? The hole is, let me give you dimensions, two feet by two feet by two feet, okay? Two wide, two long, and two deep. How much dirt is in such a hole? Quickly. Two by two by two. Anyone know? Volume? Two by two by two. The way we measure volume is length by width by height. So L times W times H, two times two times two is, so how much dirt? Okay, if you said eight, you're incorrect. <laughs> okay, and I'll tell you why. Because a hole that's two by two by two doesn't have any dirt in it. <laughs> There's no dirt in a hole, okay? By definition, that's what a hole is. There's no dirt in it, okay? You can't have dirt in a hole. Okay, that was a trick question, sorry. But either way, either way, um, the, the hole, the pit is empty and there's no water in it. Thank you so much for stating the obvious. Why does Pasuk have to clarify and emphasize that the hole is empty? So I want to share with you actually um, what the Gemara wants to tell us. The Gemara says, you know what it means, en bo ma'im? The Gemara is trying to tell, tell us something. En bo ma'im, it's trying to infer there's no water, but there is something else in it. Aval nehashim ve'akrabim yeshbo. There's no water in the pit, but there are snakes and there are scorpions. And this is what the Gemara says in Masechet Shabbat, page 22. Okay, very nice Gemara. And the obvious question for today's class, okay? If there are snakes in this pit, how in the world is Reuven here saving Yosef by throwing him in a pit with snakes? I hardly call that saving him. Guys, come on, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him into the Atlantic. Let's just leave him stranded in the middle of Antarctica. Let's not kill him. Come on, we're not bad people. Why are you going to kill him for? Yeah. So instead you just throw him in a pit with snakes? Is that any better? Right? That's the question that we're going to study today. Okay? I hope you. I hope the question is clear. Okay? The question again... Reuven here is being a hero by saving his brother and he ends up saving him by throwing him into a pit with snakes. That's barely really saving the guy, okay? You're just killing him in a different way. What's the answer to this interesting question? So there's one answer given by the Torah Temima. Okay? The Torah Temima, a great commentary on the Chumash. And look what he wants to tell us over here. Something, nothing short of fantastic. He says, how deep was this pit? By the way, do we know? We don't know. Does it say? It doesn't say. He says, actually, we do know. Because it says in the Pasuk, Vayashlichu oto abora. Vayashlich, that word, Lishloach. Says the Torah Tamima, you never use the word Lishloach unless it's something that's at least 20 amot distance. 20 amot is around 30 feet, okay? So the Torah only uses the word lishloach, shalach, when it's referring to 20 amot at least or more. This is found in Masechet Tamid at the end of the first chapter. That hashlacha, anytime the Torah uses that word, verb, to send, it's referring to 20 amot. If there it's in context of korbanot and throwing the korban and how far you have to throw it. Okay, but says the Torah Temimah, if that's the case, our pit is 20 amot deep at least. Because it says, Vayashlichu oto habora. They threw him into the pit. And if they're throwing him, and it's using the verb lishloach, to send, to cast, it must be it's 20 deep, 20 amot deep. Okay, that's cute. But what significance does that have? What does it matter if it's 20 amot deep? Anyone, does that number resonate with anybody? 20 amot? What do we know about that number, 20 Amma? Actually, it actually connects to the holiday that we're about to go into. There is a statement in the Gemara. Actually, it's on the same exact line as the one that we just read. But it's said over by the same exact rabbi. 
that said this idea of the pit being to, to, uh, with snakes and scorpions. The same rabbi on page 22 of Masechet Shabbat says the following, Ner Hanukkah, if a person has a Hanukkah candle that's placed 20 amot high, it's pasul. If you put your menorah 20 amot high, let's say you have a very, very big room and you put it all the way up, pasul. You didn't fulfill the mitzvah. In order to fulfill the mitzvah, there's an interesting question. People that live in apartment buildings on the fourth floor or higher, let's say that's 30 feet or up, how, how are they fulfilling the mitzvah that's over 30 amot? Who are they doing it for? The people on the street can't see. You're just doing it for yourself. You may as well put it in your, uh, on your dining room table. What are you putting it by the window for if your window is for a 30, amo, a 30 feet or higher? So one of the answers is that you have people across the street in the other apartment buildings that could see it, right? But the point is that anything that's placed 20 amot or more is pasu, or more than 20 amot, I should say, is pasu. We find that true by Hanukkah. We find that true where else? What other halakha can't be more than 20 amma? It's true with sukkah. If your sukkah is taller than 20 amot, it's pasul. We find it as well true with the eruv, with the string that people put in order to be able to carry. That also cannot be 20 amma. Why? Why is over 20 amma no good? Because the halakha says that a person does not notice a person in their peripheral doesn't notice things that are above 20 ammo. Right now, you're looking straight. You could see things that are 5, 10, 15 feet above you. Once something is 20 ammo high, you look straight. Now, again, if you look up, you'll see it. You could see an airplane. But the point is, if you're looking straight and you're going about a mind your own business, then you wouldn't necessarily notice something that's that, that's, that's that high. And therefore, just like a menorah that's 20 ammo high is no good, because you don't see it, says the Torah Tamima, because the pit was 20 amot deep, the brothers didn't notice the snakes and scorpions. And therefore, Reuven indeed thought he was doing his brother a favor by saving his life. Now we know that he was actually, there was a miracle going on, because there were snakes. We know that. But says the Torah Tamima, maybe they didn't know that. And I'll prove to you that they didn't know that. He says, the fact that they threw him into a pit with snakes and then nothing happens to him. Isn't that obviously a miracle? Wouldn't that shake the brothers up? Wouldn't that wake him up and they should realize, oh my goodness, we almost killed this Sadiq? Even the wicked king. Okay, who does he quote over here? Trying to find it. Take a look. Nebuchadnezzar, Hayara Shah Muchlat, the wicked Nebuchadnezzar. Once he threw Hananiah, Mishael, and Nazariah into the fire and they were saved, he did Teshuvah. Obviously, the sons of Jacob should do Teshuvah right here when they see Yosef being saved from the pit with fiery snakes and serpents. How come they don't repent? Again, the answer is they didn't know that there were snakes and scorpions. Why didn't they know? Because it was deeper than 20 amot. They didn't notice them. And for that reason, A, they didn't recognize in the miracle, and B, Reuven suggests let's throw him in there because he thought it was just temporary and I'll go get him later. So it's amazing to see how the halachot of Hanukkah really uh, coincide and everything overlaps each with the other. That's one answer of why the Uven throws him in the pit. There is another answer given by the Ora Haim, and I say this with tremendous bidchilu urhimu, with tremendous trepidation, because I would just like to preface and say that what we're gonna learn right now together in the name of the Or Haim is definitely not mainstream Jewish hashkafa, okay? It's not the ex usually accepted approach in our worldview, in our philosophy, but, it's an Ora Hayim, quoting a Zohar over here. So, um, conventional or not, it's definitely worth mentioning and uh, something worth thinking about. So let's let's read what the Ora Hayim wants to say. Okay, 
Um, so here we have, if you want to open it up and follow along. Um, I lost it, sorry. Okay, I have to open it again, one second. Um, or HaHaim. Or HaHaim, Rav Haim ben Atar, was a commentary on the Torah from Morocco, okay? Great scholar from Morocco. He was a Kabbalist and a Talmudist and a uh, commentary on the Chumash. Okay, take a look at what he says. He's going to be right here on chapter 37, Pasuk 21. And his Pasuk says, Reuven Reuven's overhearing this whole thing that they want to kill him. And so he says, let me save Yosef. Adam. Says the Or Hahayim. Please follow along. Lefi Sheha Adam Baal Behira Veratson. Says the Or Hahayim, man is a free creature, possessing freedom of choice. Veyachol Laharog Mishelonit Hayev Mita. And it's possible for man to kill someone who is not guilty and has not been convicted from God from above. Torah Haim Abiyah is saying something very frightening. He is suggesting that it's very possible that a person, because we have free will and we are created in the Tzele Melokim, part of free will means that we can take things into our own hands. And it's very possible that there will be somebody who is walking down the street and he is a good guy and innocent and his time didn't come up till he's supposed to die at the age of 100. But because here is this evil man that has free will, he can use his freedom of choice to interfere even with your own life. And it's very possible that he'll kill someone that's not Chayav Mitayet, that wasn't supposed to die at that very second. And it's possible for men to interfere with God's plans. That's what the Ora Hayim is saying. However, when it comes to beasts which do not kill humans, they don't have the right, they don't have free choice animals, and therefore, they do not kill humans unless the latter are guilty of death in the eyes of God. So the Ora Hayim is saying here, is that here is what Reuven is trying to say to the brothers. You think that by killing Yosef, that'll prove that his dreams were false? That'll prove that all along he was just he was just saying his own dreams and he was never really meant to be the king because if he was, then obviously there's no way we could kill him? It's not true. It's very possible that Yosef, maybe he was supposed to be the leader and we're supposed to bow down to him. But because we killed him, we thwarted God's plans. Frightening. That's what the Ora Haim says. Man has free will and he can even sabotage things that were decreed from above. And maybe if it's decreed that Yosef should be a ruler, we can sabotage that. That's what the Ora Haim is teaching us. And therefore, says Reuven, we should not kill him. If we really want to put the dream to the test, the only way to really test out the dream is not for us to kill him, but put him into the hands of animals. Because animals are only puppets in God's hands. Animals are controlled by a, by a God. And therefore, animals can, uh, if he's guilty, will kill him. And if he's not, they won't kill him. We can kill him even if he's not guilty. Unbelievable. So this is what the Or HaHayim is saying, okay? The Or HaHayim over here is teaching us something very, very deep, okay? And that is that man, because we have free will, sometimes we could take matters into our own hands, whether it's on other people or on ourselves. So as an example, if a person is going to be negligent, a person is going to go out there, and a person could have greatness waiting for them, a person could have the world promised, Hashem decreed this year on Rosh Hashanah that you are going to make billions and that you're going to get married and that you're going to have children. But because a person did things, he could ruin those promises. We actually found that last week. When Yaakov Avinu, when Yaakov Avinu, what happened? He was coming to meet his brother Esav 
And what does the Pasuk say? Vayira Yaakov me'od. Yaakov was afraid. Why was he afraid? He was afraid because even though God promised him greatness and God promised him protection and God promised him everything, he was afraid that maybe he ruined that. Maybe he loses that. So sometimes a person can do things to remove greatness that's coming to them. If a person is supposed to get married this year, but they decide to just stay away from everyone and they never go out and they're just, you know, killing it and ruining it for themselves and they just remain just rude and nasty and they just don't put themselves out there on the market and they just give off negative energy. So you could ruin your nasib. You could ruin it. You could ruin your parnasa. Oh, if I'm supposed to make money, I'll make it. Maybe, but you could also use your free will and destroy it. This is what the Ora Hayim is saying. If they kill Yosef, it doesn't prove anything. It's definitely possible that his dreams were supposed to come true, but they thwarted God's plans. Okay? And by the way, there is a, a pasuk that man can sabotage things that were decreed from above. Vayomer David el Gad, we say this every day. Vayomer David el Gad, Tsar li me'od. David says to God, I'm in, I'm in, a, I'm in tremendous distress. Nipelana beyad Adonai. Let us fall into the hands of men. Ubiyad Adam, uh, excuse me, excuse me, beyad Amonai in the hands of God. Ubiyad Adam Alepola. Let us not fall into the hands of men. Because it's very possible that men will act cruel towards us more than we deserve. Okay, so this is the Ora Haim. Definitely worth mentioning something that he says. It's right here, unless there's maybe a more depth to it. On face value, the Ora Hayim is saying, what is he saying? Can man disappoint God's decrees? Yes. Okay? Man can interfere with God's plan. Okay, that's what he seems to be saying. Now, does everyone agree to this? Like we said, 100% not. Okay? Mainstream majority hold not like this just to mention a few okay we turn to the famous Rabbeinu Bahye in the book of Shemot Perashat Mishpatim chapter 21 verse 13 okay over here a lot of different laws Pasuk says if one who strikes a person shall be put to death but if he did not do it on purpose but it came about by an act of God then you have to go and flee to Galut. Says Rabbeinu Bahye. I'll read it to you in English. But if he did not lay in ambush, etc. The verse speaks, the verse speaks of unintentional killing. The word tzada means there had not been a deliberate hunt to kill the person in question by his eventual killer. However, God had intervened causing this man to kill someone because he had already been guilty for committing another capital sin which had either not been detected or could not been prosecuted. That means, says Rabbeinu Bahye, if we see that A killed B, it's because B was already guilty of death. He already did something to deserve death. But no one saw. He wasn't prosecuted. So don't worry. God's going to make sure to bring someone to kill you. And that's what's going on over here. You know why? If the killer had not already been guilty of a similar crime, the Torah would not have described the unintentional killing as an act of God. Rather than as an act of man. By the way, the Gemara already illustrated this with the well-known parable of two men. One of whom killed intentionally, whereas the other killed unintentionally. So just imagine, okay, two guys. Call them uh, A and B. A killed intentionally and he deserves to get killed. B killed unintentionally. He deserves galut. God arranges that these people meet at the same place at the same time. The one who, who is guilty of unintentional killing ascends a ladder and falls down, killing the person that's standing underneath who is already guilty of intentional killing. So the person that falls has to now go to galut like he already had to do. And the one who died is killed like he already was guilty of having to get killed. 
So it's very interesting over here, Rabbi Nubaye is saying, quoting Gemara Masech Makot, that the Pasuk says, Veha Elohim ina leyado. This is God's doing. If someone kills someone else, that's from above. Okay? And this is, this is the emunah that today we usually accept. It's something that we just saw just a couple of weeks ago with the crazy case going on in Brooklyn with that Jewish girl that was married to a guy that she, showed, that she thought was Jewish and he turned out to be Lebanese, uh, Arab, complete Arab. I don't know if you're following the story. He just didn't like, you know, the, like the people that he was born into and he wanted to be Jewish. He liked the Jewish lifestyle. He just never converted. So he made up this whole story that his family's Jews and he lied. And uh, he marries this Jewish girl and she, she finds Lebanese passports and she investigates and she realizes that he's a complete Arab. Okay, the story in, and really a lot of the, a lot of the blame here can be technically be put on the rabbi that married them off. Okay, obviously she should have done her homework and whoever should have done their homework, but also the rabbi that wed them. Part of a rabbi's job is looking into the families, making sure that they're legitimate. And there was a whole letter that the rabbi did put out apologizing tremendously. I don't know if you heard this story. I don't know if you heard this recording of the father of this kala, the father of the bride. And he's sending out a whole recording saying to the rabbi who apologized and he's in tears as he's saying it and it's in arabic so if you don't speak arabic i don't think you'll understand it or it's partially in arabic but either way it's just worth listening to it's so moving he's saying basically to the rabbi it's not your fault this is from hashem it was decreed to happen regardless you're a tzaddik and it's it's a shame that it had to fall into your lap but it's really from god and it was decreed from above and he said, of course, you know, I forgive you and it's not your fault and please don't take this personally, etc., etc. So it's such a moving um, and such an amazing level of imunah to live with that level of imunah. That's what the Rabbeinu Bahia is saying. That when something happens to us in life, again, not like the Ora Ha'im, when something happens, the, res- the, the question should be, um, you know, not why did this person do it to me, but the question should be, why is God doing it to me? Because that's that's how we, that's the hashkafa of here that's being uh, intro, introduced to realize that if something happens, the pasuk says veha Elohim in God's doing it. If a guy falls from a ladder, that wasn't his clumsiness that caused him to fall from the ladder. That was God who was interfering and wanted him to fall from the ladder because the person under deserved the death. Okay, again. We're only saying this over here in a classroom, studying Perasha on a Zoom. Chas v'shalom again, to ever say this to someone who's going through something. It must be, you deserve it. Hashem made it happen. Obviously, never, 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 chas v'shalom to ever make such remarks. The obvious question, the obvious question is that you may say, I know what some of you are thinking. So Rabbi, anyways, the guy who who got killed was supposed to die from the heavens. So the murderer is just an agent. So why are we punishing the murderer? He's just a messenger from Hashem. It's not his fault. Right? Good question. If you want to live your life with the philosophy that whatever happens was already decreed, then every thief and every murderer and every rapist, they're just doing whatever was decreed from above. Okay, so the answer to this question, we already know the answer. The answer we already was this question was already asked when it came to the Breed Ben Abetarim to the covenant of the parts that God presented with Abraham when God told Abraham that his children will be slaves and tortured and then etagoy the nation that they're going to torture them I will also judge them and I will punish them so God already decreed that he's going to have the Jews enslaved and then he's going to punish their oppressors so obviously over there the commentaries all ask why are you punishing the Egyptians What did the Egyptians do wrong? It was already decreed that they're going to be punished, that they're going to be slaves. So that's, we have a class already, a few classes on that. Um, Answers that are given is, uh, they didn't do it specifically to be agents of God. They didn't know it was decreed. They were just doing it out of the cruelty of their hearts. 
uh, that's the answer that's given by the Ramban, or uh, maybe the Rambam says they did more than they were supposed to, etc., etc. But this is, anyways, the question is already asked by Misraim, and many answers are given over there. Just to bring one more source, the Ga'on Mevilna, Rav Achanan Wasim, and many sources, but just to bring one more source that agrees, again, with Rabbeinu Bahye, that um, whatever happens in life is already decreed from Hashem, is the Sefer HaChinuch, okay? Sefer HaChinuch, we don't know who wrote it, but it's a great book from the Rishonim era, from the medieval scholars. And uh, Mitzvah number 241, he goes through the Torah, explaining each and every mitzvah, uh, who it applies to, when it applies, maybe a little bit of the rationale behind it. So one of the mitzvot is Lo Tikom. Anyone heard of that mitzvah? No revenge. Lo Lenakim. You're not allowed to take revenge from a Jew. Let's say he gives an example. Yisrael shehara otzar lahavero behamikol dvarim. Let's say a Jew bother you. Let's say someone, right? Ever happened to you that a Jew bothered you? Right? No, never, right? Okay, fine. Let's say someone bothered you. They spoke bad about you. They threw garbage on your side of the street. Something. Most people will find ways to get back. Get even. Right? Get even. You hurt me, I hurt you. You threw garbage, you threw snow on my side, I throw snow on your side. You, right, you, uh, you hurt me, I'm gonna now, in, I'm gonna embarrass you. We're gonna make, we're gonna get even. Okay? And therefore the Torah says, Lo tikom, not allowed to get even. Not allowed to get revenge. You ask your neighbor to borrow their uh, tennis racket, you ask your neighbor to borrow some chairs for a party and they said, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm going to need them. And you know that they didn't need them. They were sitting in the garage the whole time, liars. Then a week later, they ask you to borrow your table. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Woo. Revenge is sweet, right? Says the Torah, Loti Kom, not allowed. Not allowed to get Nekama. Amar lo hashileni magalcha. You ask your neighbor to borrow his utensil. And he didn't give it to you. And then the next day he asks you. Not allowed to not give it. And that's how, and you know what? You're not even allowed to say, by the way, I'm not giving it to you because you didn't give it to me. Just, you know, just remember what goes around comes around. I'll do that. That's lotikom. Says the Sefer HaHinuch. Why? Why can't I get revenge? Why not? Isn't it fair? You don't want to give me your stuff, so fine, don't give me your stuff. I won't give you my stuff. Says Rabbeinu, says Sefer HaChinuch, Sheyeda HaAdam, a person must know, Ve'yiten libo and internalize, Ki kol asher yikrahu, whatever happens to us, Mitov Adra, from good to bad, Kusiba, Shetavo alav me'et Hashem Baruch. Whatever happens in life is really all just a decree from above. Umiyad adam, miyad ish ahiv, lo davar. Nobody, not your brother, not a person, could do anything. Bilti retzon Hashem baruch unless God already decreed it. Al ken and therefore, kshayetzaru when a person bothers you or yarivu or hurts you. Yeda ben afshol, please listen. You must know in your soul. Ki avonotav garmu. When a person is bothered or hurt, he must realize that his own sins caused this to come upon himself. Someone punched you in the face. Says the Sefer Ahinuch, he's telling us, we must realize if we got punched in the face, my sins caused that. Hashem nitbarach gazar alav bekach. God decreed that I should get punched in the face. Someone hurt me in business? Someone didn't pay me? Okay? Anyone have outstanding balances that weren't paid to them? I know I do. A person shouldn't think, what should I do to get back at this guy? He owes me money. She did this to me. This person is not the reason. Why you're having pain? Ha'avon hu mesav. You're looking for the reason. The reason is your sins. Like David says, 
Hani hulo veyikalel ki amar lo Hashem. Remember when Shem'i ben Gera curses David HaMelech? What did David say? <gasps> How could you curse me? I'm going to now get back at you. David didn't say it. You know what he said? It's not him cursing me. He's a puppet. Okay, he's a puppet. Right? If someone throws something at you, do you get angry at the rock that they threw? They're just a puppet. I get angry at the thrower. God said, God said he should curse me, and therefore in life, my friends, says the Sefer HaChinuch, when something comes our way that we don't appreciate, we don't like, we need to not look outwards and blame, but we need to point the finger inwards and ask ourselves, what did we do wrong? Because we are guilty if something happened to us. Because if we weren't guilty, then there's no way that this would happen. What a tremendous lesson. What a value. What a hashkafa. What an approach to life. To realize that anything that happens. Someone hits your car. Could you imagine someone hits your car? The Ora Hayim, you know what he would say? Ora Hayim would say, someone hit your car. It's the guy's fault. He was negligent. If it wasn't decreed, it's still possible he'll hit you. But that's not what the Hinuch here is saying. That's not what the Rabbi Bahia is saying. It's not what the Ga'on Mavilna or others are saying. Over here we're seeing the opposite. We're seeing that whatever happens, it's all decreed from above. Is there a happy middle? There definitely is something to be said about someone who's negligent. If someone is negligent, then everyone agrees that it's their fault. Even these commentaries who say it's all from above. So as an example... If someone's going to jump off a building and they're going to die, no one should say, oh, it was already decreed he's going to die. If you're negligent and you're in a relationship and you punch your spouse in the face and you throw her down the steps and then you get a divorce, you get served, right? Don't say, oh, look, it's all from Shamaim. I'm supposed to get divorced. <laughs> no, you idiot. You're supposed to not punch people in the face. You can't be negligent and then blame God for your mistakes. Okay? Rabbi Reisman always says, if you wake up late and then you miss your flight and say, oh, it's all mishamayim. <laughs> no, it's a sign that next time you should wake up on time. If you're going to be negligent... If you're going to be lazy, if you're going to be lax in your responsibilities and things happen to you, that's your fault. Don't blame God for your mistakes. We love doing that, by the way. We love making mistakes, but then saying, oh, it's all Hashem. It's all Hashem. Depends. If we're being negligent, then we can't play it's the all Hashem card. Okay? But either way, I think there's a lot to chew over here. Very interesting uh, to see how... Sometimes halakha and Hanukkah and pits and all these things connect. Uh, but also a very interesting uh, philosophical question. You know, how much control does man have? According to Allah Hayim, a lot. According to others, very little. Um, uh, but at least, at least the things that are in between, we can and must do our due diligence. Okay, we'll stop over here, everybody. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.